the introduction. Um, this is the field's uh, postdoc colloquium, is designed as an opportunity for the postdoctoral fellows, either attached to a thematic program or not attached to a thematic program, to uh, get together, talk about all their work, have an opportunity to practice explaining their work to people in other disciplines and uh, just generally have a bit of a community. Of course, it's hard to do. I don't think anybody's at the office today, including me, but uh, hopefully we've got our goal set on February 21st as being the day when we can get going again. So I'm very happy to have today uh, Siegfried Van Hella, who's going to tell us about O-minimality and parameterizations. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, let me, oh, that's, Okay, now it's going to work. So let me start by some um, remarks to, to begin. So I am a postdoctoral fellow with an ongoing thematic program. And if you are also participating in it, then I have to apologize that um, many of the things that I'm going to talk about, let's say for the first at least 40 minutes probably, uh, are not going to be new. So uh, I'm sorry for that, but uh, I see many other people in the audience that perhaps uh, we'll hear this for the first time, so uh, that makes me quite happy. So the, the talk is mainly in, aimed towards uh, people that don't know this material. Okay, so where most of this talk you could situate in the, in the field of model theory, although I'm not at all a model theorist. Um, but if you know model theory, uh, you will probably understand uh, way better most of the results. Or, um, but I'll not phrase it in terms of model theory. Okay, so I've already put, uh, let's say the main reference to learn about ominous structures on, on the screen. So it's this book by uh, Lau van den Dries, Think Topology and Ominous Structures. And let me first comment about this, uh, this word, tame topology. So tame topology refers to the nice properties that for instance, semi-algebraic or sub-analytic sets I have, um, or more generally, this is a word I believe that was uh, invented by Grotendieck that was looking for sets or a category where uh, similar properties hold. Uh, so uh, I hope to convince you today that O minimality is somehow some framework that uh, gives you this thing topology. And so then uh, the first paper maybe where um, O minimality arised or was studied, but in, in terms of model theory, there was definable sets in order structures one. And as the title suggests, there is also a two and a three. The two was uh, joined with Julian Knight. The other two are by Pile and Steinhorn. So that's a, a good reference to start, but it's model theoretic. If you don't like model theory, then you should read this book in, in my opinion. Okay, so let's start. What is an O minimal structure? So a structure on the reals is um, a bunch of subsets that satisfy, um, let's say, geometric conditions. So the first one is that you can do Boolean operations with the set. So you can take unions, intersections, and so on. Um, we want some minimal amount of sets to be in there. For instance, diagonals. Uh, so a line through the origin in R2, for instance. Um, you also want projections and uh, products of sets. So that's very natural uh, if you want to do geometry. And then we are going to uh, put some conditions on these, on these sets. So the first one, um, let's say, that explains the O in O minimal. So we want the order to, be, um, to belong to our structures. So that means that this set, uh, the set of all X smaller than Y, is a set that is in our structure something we want to, uh, to have. And then, uh, well, we want it to be minimal. So we will ask that the, the subsets of R1, so of the reals are just finite unions of intervals and points. So that's uh, let's say minimal axiom. Okay. So let me first start with a non-example. So abstractly just consider the smallest structure that contains a graph of the sine function, then it uh, is going to violate this, this minimal axiom because it has infinitely many zeros. And so this will define uh, discrete sets, infinite discrete sets. And also 
something like this would live in such a structure. And so if the idea is that we are going to make tame geometry, then you don't want something like this. Um, so in any course in topology, you would call this pathological. So you, you don't want the sine function to, to live in your structure. And then throughout this talk, uh, as I've mentioned, it's bit in model theory. If I say that the set X is definable, which is a notion from model theory, you can just ignore the word definable and think ah, this is a set that belongs to the structure, one of these sets that I'm interested in. And similarly, I call a function definable if its graph is, um, is, is such a set in this structure. I'll give an example of a definable function later. Um, so if I say definable, um, it belongs to the structure. I'll give examples so you can also keep these in mind. So okay, first an actual example. So we're going to look at semi-algebraic sets and the structure is usually or often denoted just by R, a bar or R alt. So what is a semi-algebraic set? These are all sets that you can write in this form. So they are determined by polynomial equalities and inequalities. Um, and so it's a famous theorem of Tarski uh, that the, the projection of such a set is again, uh, well, that, 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 that this class of sets is closed on the projection. And so here are two examples of, of semi-algebraic sets. So the first one is, is just a disk. Um, is clearly given by a polynomial inequality. And then uh, we can even cut out of this uh, disk um, another region and you get something like this. So these are semi-algebraic sets. Okay, then we will go to a larger class. So the, the class of globally subanalytic sets, usually denoted Rn. So then I have to introduce the notion of a restricted analytic function. So as the name suggests, it's the restriction of an analytic function. So more precisely, um, you take some function f that is analytic on an open neighborhood of the unit box. Um, and then you define small f to be, well, it just coincides with this big f on the unit box and outside of this region, I'm going to put it identically zero. And if you think again about the sine function, so you are not going to allow the entire sine function, but you can allow uh, a finite a bounded uh, part of it. And then it has finitely many zeros, obviously. Okay, so then I define the notion of a basic function. That's the composition of all these uh, restricted analytic functions and the same algebraic functions that we have seen in the previous structure. And then a set is globally subanalytic if uh, it's again given by equalities and uh, inequalities of such functions. And so uh, a well-known theorem in this, in this field is that the complement of a subanalytic set is uh, uh, again a subanalytic set. So it's given by uh, such a description. Okay, a third example is Rx. So you could call them exponential algebraic sets. And I could call them, I don't see this word in literature, um, but I'll call them exponential algebraic for now. So instead of using subanalytic functions, again, forget about this, just consider polynomials, but you're now allowed to use the uh, exponential function. Okay, and, and Wilkie's theorem actually says, um, ah, Wilkie's theorem actually says, <laughs> basically the above, but is, the, is not the definition of our exp, but it's actually the definition that I gave here is Wilkie's theorem. So um, these subsets are projections of these kind of sets. So uh, I forgot to mention this, but it's very important. We now look at projections of, of these kind of sets. And so not just X in Rn, but Rn plus K. So we're going to project. Um, so, okay, an example of a, of a definable set. So the exponential function is uh, of course, definable here. So I'm giving here a formula, it's defined by y is equal to uh, x of x. Okay. Uh, and it's not globally subanalytic. Um, the reason for this is that it has, um, let's say, a bad behavior at infinity, behavior that subanalytic sets don't have. Okay. And then there is a very special. Um, something special going on in this case. So apparently you can just merge these last two examples together and you get a, a structure. It's, a, it's in particular O minimal. 
which if you think about it, uh, it's not so easy to show because if you take more and more sets, it, it actually could violate the fact that you don't want, you don't want to add many new definable sets in R because then it could happen maybe that it's not going to be just finite unions of points and intervals. So it's quite surprising that you, you, yeah, we are trying, we are always trying to look for uh, larger structures while still keeping the amount of definable sets very low. So you, you can expect that it's not easy to just make it larger. So uh, in fact, it's not true. So um, there is a theorem uh, that actually gives you an example of two or minimal structures that you cannot merge. So what does this theorem say? Um, you can take any smooth function and then you can write it as a sum of two other functions, each definable in an O minimal structure. Um, so yeah, that's the result. Um, so for instance, if you now take the sine function, then apparently I can write it as a sum of two functions, each definable in an O minimal structure, but then you see that these two O minimal structures, you cannot merge them together in any way because then the sine function Will be defined or will be definable in this uh, larger structure. And so, in general, it's not possible to merge or minimal structures, or, or just take the union or something like above as it's the smaller structure containing all global superanalytic sets and the algebraic uh, exponential sets. You cannot do that in general. But in this case, this works. Okay. Um, so let me give a small map of known or minimal structure. So our algebra was the semi-algebraic set. Then um, you can do a certain operation to the right. It's called well, taking the Pfaffian enclosure. I'm not really explain what it is, um, but you can add functions in, in this way. Um, and our x bar, the exponential algebraic sets, and there's something in between. These are um, irrational power functions. So for instance, x to the power of pi with this, would live in a, in a structure r to the power k. So it's not a semi-algebraic function. And it's also not a subanalytic function. Okay, then you can let's say go downwards in this diagram. Uh, going downwards roughly means that you are going to add analytic functions or restrictions of certain functions. And so we get the subanalytic sets. We also get some RWs that live between uh, semi-algebraic sets and subanalytic sets. In some way, these are um, restrictions of a uh, smaller class of analytic functions. And then you can play a game. Um, here, you can always add or more functions to it, and it stays all minimal. And then RN has some larger expansions. Uh, some are restrictions of quasi-analytic functions that you can add, uh, and you can also add certain kind of uh, power series. To, to your structure. Uh, and then again, you can add the exponential or do this Pfaffian enclosure operation and you get even a larger O minimal structures. And very recently, I don't think it's already on the archive, but so you can even merge these two into a, well, these two. So the result that you can merge them into one O minimal structure. So to my knowledge, that would be somewhat uh, the largest O minimal structure that we know. Okay. So now I've given you plenty of examples. Let's uh, see some of these same geometry properties. So all of these properties are the first properties you would read in this uh, book that I've shown you in introduction by uh, Van den Dries. Okay, so the first uh, result is a result on unredefinable functions. So if F is defined on some domain U, well, then you can decompose this domain into, of course, a finite union of intervals and points, and the restriction of F to these uh, domains is then uh, strictly monotone. And as usual in this theory, you can also ask for continuous, continuously differentiable, and then if you have continuously differentiable, you just iterate and you get any uh, finite number uh, of times continuously differentiable. So the reason behind it is because being continuous and differentiable can be expressed in, in first order logic. And so it's a, say it's a definable notion. 
And so clearly this lemma is false for the sign of X. So even if I have not convinced you yet that this cannot live in an O-minimal structure, well, firstly, it violates the O-minimal axiom anyway, if you take sine of X is zero, but if you don't know model theory, well, this is clear a geometric result. That's not true for the sine function. Okay, then the, I have to introduce the notion of a cell now. Um, these are the building blocks, let's say, in O minimality, but you also have uh, cells in other fields of mathematics, let's say algebraic topology. You also try to make, um, you also use cells there. And so they are, uh, they have a very easy structure. And so that gives you topological information and makes us that manageable to work with. So what is a cell? So a cell in just R is either a point or an open interval. So this interval can have uh, plus or minus infinity as endpoints. And then I'm going to inductively uh, explain what a cell in R n plus one is. So if you have a, a cell C in Rn, then you just take uh, the uh, definable continuous function uh, and you take its graph. And that's going to be a cell in R n plus one. So uh, here's a picture of a cell in R2. And then the other one is, of course, you just take the region between such two functions. Well, actually, the zoom window is right. I hope you can see the picture. I think so. I cannot see it myself. Uh, but so you can also take the region between two such graphs, or you take, you are also allowed to take plus and minus infinity, of course. And so in the, by using inductive steps in this way, for each, in each step, you, you either do the first operation, you take the graph of a function, or you take the region between such two, and then you go on. And so it's clear that these cells are always connected, uh, and it's well, obvious what their dimension is. So for instance, the first one here has dimension one and the other one has dimension two. Um, and for instance, every time you would just choose to use a graph of a function, you do not increase your dimension. And if you do the second operation, you increase it by one. And so these are the building blocks of O minimality because of the following theorem. Well, every definable set is a finite union of cells. Um, so for instance, in, in uh, arithmetic, you know, uh, computational algebraic geometry. This is something like cylindrical uh, decomposition of an uh, algebraic set. But now for uh, just an abstract uh, class of functions and sets. So it also works for functions. That's what I want to say. So if you have a definable function, you can decompose the Rn or its domain into cells and the restriction of the function to each of these cells is going to be continuous. Uh, and of course, if you start to get the story, you can ask for CR as well. Good, so it's important to notice, so we have only imposed a small axiom on the, on the definable sets of the line, and apparently these are strong consequences for um, sets in any dimension. So it's really, it's equivalent. And um, this, this cell decomposition theorem is the main ingredient of groups in uh, of minimality. So usually you do something like this. You, you want a certain definable property, let's say like continuous, well, then you use cell decomposition uh, and these cells will satisfy, well, usually your property will then be satisfied on these cells. So this is, uh, you will see it later again. Okay, other nice properties that um, hold in all minimal structure. So suppose you have some set X that is a subset of Rn times R. So we are going to see Rn as a space of parameters in this, in this case. So then for any X in the base, you suppose that the fiber is finite. Well, then there is a uniform bound on, the, on these finite, uh, it's a finite set. So you can wonder how does this finite number vary uh, when you take X along the base. And so the theorem is that if it's a definable set, then this number well has to be bounded uniformly. And so whenever you do a proving of minimality and something you have finitely many depending on parameters, then usually you can just say, well, this, this number does not really depend on the parameters. So that's nice to have. Another result is that, well, 
again, something about fibers, but maybe a little bit better, you can even continuously choose fibers. So if you have set, this is what the picture that you can have in mind, you can structure your function f, this f is going to be definable. And you can, of course, then make it continuous when you restrict your cells. Uh, so this gives you in some way a very strong axiom of choice if you want. Okay, that was the part or a very short introduction to O minimality and, and results. Are there any questions so far? No. Okay. So the next I'm going to discuss the second part that I put in my abstract. So the Pilar Wilkie theorem is perhaps one of the most um, known applications of O minimality at this moment. Um, so I will start with introducing some number theoretical terms that seem unrelated. So first, the height of a rational point is just the maximum of its enumerator and denominator, where you, of course, assume that they have a greatest common, greatest common divider one. Uh, and then the idea that you are going to study, well, you, you are going to bound, you put a bound on the height of the rational points, then there are only finitely many such point, points. For instance, if the height is at most uh, one, then of course you only have one and minus one that have height one. And for height two, you can easily figure out how many uh, rationals you can make uh, with denominator and denominator at most two. So this, this, when you put a bound on the height, there are only finitely many such rational points. And so you can intersect a set X with this, with these rationals that have at most this height. And so the idea is that, of course, if you increase the height, then you get more and more of your rational numbers. Uh, and so, and this is going to approximate your set as well. And so you hope that by reading, by counting this number of rational points that you get some information about your set by, by this approximation and, ju and just counting to the growth of rational points. And that's actually the pilar Wilkie counting theorem is such a, a statement. So before I can state it, one more definition. So if you have any set in the reals, then you can take its algebraic part. And so this is the union, infinite union of all semi-algebraic sets of dimension at least one contained in X. And then it's complement or everything that's not in this set is denoted the transcendental part of X. So then, what does the counting theorem says, say? Um, so if you have a set that lives in an O minimal structure, then this number of pound points on this transcendental part or the growth of the rational points on this transcendental part, well, you can force them to grow slower than any polynomial. Because if you take a polynomial, well, um, it's just for any epsilon, uh, you can bound it by t to the power epsilon. So whatever the degree of the polynomial is, just take epsilon smaller and it will go slower. Um, but of course, it comes, this comes at the expense of, of creating a larger constant. But asymptotically, this is a, a, still an interesting statement. Um, usually in the applications, uh, people use the other direction. So they, they try to violate this upper bound. They say like, I, I have found polynomial in many rational points on this transcendental part. Well, or I, I have found a set and it has polynomial in many rational points. Uh, well, then this uh, theorem is going to tell you and uh, then there must be some semi-algebraic sets contained in this set. So just a negation of this statement. Well, if there are too many, that means that we have, that you did not exclude some semi-algebraic sets. So some remarks on this x alg because it's actually a complicated set if you think about it. So the reason that we exclude it, well, I've just said by the negation, if you have polynomial in many rational points and it detects a semi-algebraic set, and indeed semi-algebraic sets, it's not so well. You can easily see that they contain polynomial in many rational points. So there are at least that, that contain polynomial in many rational points. I given here an elementary example, should just take the graph of the X going to X squared and it has roughly T to the power one half many rational points. 
And also, so this set does not behave very well. So I said, you take an infinite union, uh, which often, of course, is, uh, can be rather wild. So um, for example, if you just take an open set in Rn, then it's just going to be algebraic, well, in this sense. So U is going to be U alg. Why is that? Well, because if you take a point, in this open set, well, then you can easily find just a small curve that goes through this point, semi-algebraic curve. And so it's, it, it lies in the algebraic part. So in particular, if you look at this set U, even though I, it's the region below the exponential function, which is something transcendental, uh, this set is going to be algebraic. Um, and moreover, because you take an infinite union, this set may also not be definable. So there's a more complicated example here, but it could happen that this is just a, let's say, discrete union of um, semi-algebraic sets. And so that cannot leave a discrete union that, that does not live in an ominimal structure. And so for these reasons, in the proof of this theorem, uh, the, the exact statement of the theorem is deeper than this. So they, uh, to prove the theorem, you want to exclude some W that is definable. And so actually they prove something stronger because they exclude a smaller set while still achieving the same upper bound on this growth of the rational points. So uh, yeah, they prove something stronger and this tells, uh, this tells you in some examples also something better. Okay, what, what do you do with this um, reliability theorem? Uh, I cannot really say much about this, but uh, I think it's interesting um, why it um, is so interesting for, for people. So they, they are, it is used to prove conjectures of the following form. So if X has many special points, then X itself must be special. So here are two of such statements which are, well, they're no longer conjectures and you can prove them uh, with this philosophy. And the idea is that these special points that they relate via some definable function uh, to, to, to rational points. And so if you have many uh, special points, then you must, must, contain, uh, so, yeah, must contain something special or you are special. So that's actually, again, this negation of the Pilar-Wilke statement. If you have many rational points, then you must contain something semi-algebraic. And this is, uh, roughly speaking, the idea of, of this approach. So if you are interested in this, I suggest you uh, read this survey paper by uh, Thomas Cannon. OK, let me say a few words about the proof ingredient of the Pilar-Wilke theorem. So the first one is called the determinant method, which was developed by uh, Pila from the pila wilkie theorem and uh, Bombiri, so I think in 1986 or something already. Um, so it's a complicated statement with a lot of input. So you have an M and N and D and a T. Um, let me first maybe give you what does this theorem say in a, in a simpler way. So suppose you have this finite amount of rational points of height at most t, and you want to uh, find a number of hypersurfaces of degree at most d. Uh, how many do you need? How many hypersurfaces do you need such that each of these rational points will lie uh, on at least one hypersurface? So of course, for instance, if you take the degree equal to, to one, uh, just a hyperplane, well, then you can imagine that if you have uh, many rational points that you will need several hyperplanes. Of course, if you let the degree grow, then you get hypersurfaces. They have, well, let's say, more degrees of freedom, so you can catch more rational points. Uh, and so this, this ID is what this theorem actually uh, captures. So it gives you an upper bound on how many hypersurfaces of degree D you need um, to catch all, all rational points up to height at most T. And so the input of the theorem is, is an M, which is just the dimension of your set. N is the ambient, the dimension of the ambient space. So D is the degree of your hypersurfaces and T is some, some threshold on the, on the height. But then there is this extra condition. So, so then you get this, this information that, that you can see that I claim. But so there is this property and it starts with if X is the image of some CR map phi. So this, um, 
is still unclear. And, and this R is given by the state. So you need to be the image of a sufficiently smooth map for this method to work. And so, well, this is exactly ominimality. So uh, we get this for free by ominimality that, that every X can be written in this way. So more precisely, you get a, a CR parameterization theorem. So if X is definable in an ominimal structure, well, then it's a finite union of such maps as in the previous uh, statements. Uh, okay, and actually this theorem is then the, the main result of the Pinaviotti paper. So the, the previous result was already known a while ago, while this CR parameterization theorem somehow was, uh, is the main ingredient of this paper and it takes most of the space. And so this is going to be the topic of uh, the last part of this talk. Okay, there is also uh, Wilkie's conjecture. So it's a refinement of this pilar wilkie statement uh, for the special case that you put the O-minimal structure RxPL. So your set is now what I call exponential algebraic. And then you can improve the bound not to just a well, sub-polynomial, but it's really a polynomial in log T. Um, good. Now this requires, well, if you would like to prove this theorem via the same method, which is what you would naturally try, then you need a required version of this determinant method, and this exists. So that's, that's I think, why people really are trying to do the same method. Right, so you can just modify this, this complicated statement about a number of hypersurfaces, such that, for instance, this number of hypersurfaces is going to be of order log t. So all you need to do, well, is again to find the second ingredient, a good parameterization here. Uh, but this then gets more subtle. So for instance, you now need to know, well, we have the second theorem says you can cover X with finitely many of such maps. Well, now you will have, well, you will need to know um, how many of these maps you need in terms of R. So R is uh, how smooth these maps are. You can imagine that if you want to increase the smoothness of this parameterization, that you will need more functions. And so, um, you want to prove that it increases polynomially R. Uh, and then there is a second condition that arises from the induction scheme if you try to prove the theorem, is that if you intersect X with a hypersurface of the degree at most T, so that's what you try to do, you catch these rational points. Well, and you, and you try to, uh, well, the step would be, you use this parameterization theorem applied to this intersection. And so then you again get some number and which I denote an R here as well. Uh, but then this, this amount of charge should also be polynomial in this, in this D. So it's a very technical condition. It just arises from the proof. Um, and so in the next section, I will, I will mainly discuss about these numbers and, and the results toward this direction. Other questions? No, okay. So parameterization. So I've put here again the definition of a parameterization. Um, in this section, and even in the last one, uh, well, let me make a distinction. So the result that I've shown to you in, in O minimal structure, so there you get finitely many maps. And in fact, these maps are definable in your O minimal structures. So this is an extra property. But for the proof of this PWK theorem, that's actually not so relevant. You just need to know that they are CR. It's actually not important at all that they are definable. Of course, if you're going to use O minimality to prove the existence of such maps, it's, you expect that they are definable automatically. So in fact, in this pilar Wilkie theorem, these maps are definable, but in principle, uh, this is not necessary. So here in my definition, I do not ask that these maps by I are definable, but they should just be CR. And I put uh, this condition here um, that phi i 
differentiated with respect to alpha is at most one. That's usually got at the CR norm of phi i is most one. So that's that's what we are interested in, uh, and in particular in the amount of maps and r. So which results do we know in this fashion? So there is a very old or relatively old result uh, for semi-algebraic sets by Domdin and Gromov, uh, and then later. Uh, the most general result that we actually know up to date is the one by Pila and Wilkie that I've just shown you. And so, but these are uh, less interesting from the point of view if you want to study this and R. They are not explicit, they just say finitely many. And so, explicit results, if you want to know something about this and R, are fairly recent. So, the one, well, the first result. By being a mini and Novikov, well, it says if you have a sub analytic set, so that means definable in Rn or uh, inequalities with polynomials and restricted analytic functions, well, then you can parameterize such a set um, indeed with an, a number that is polynomial in R. And moreover, they also know the degree of this polynomial, that's this m is the dimension of x. And they have extra information that, that we also want to know if you intersect with, um, if X is semi algebraic and you intersect with a hypersurface of degree D, then you will achieve that this extra constant C here, which in general just depends on X. You can make it more explicit, you can take it polynomial in D. Then uh, a slightly more recent result, although it appeared earlier on archive, um, holds for a slightly larger class of um, definable functions. So they are power subanalytic, or if you remember my chart of all minimal structures, this would be Rn with a k. So you're going to add irrational powers. You can also parameterize them. The statement is roughly the same. You have C R to the power D, so it's polynomial in R but um, they did not make this exponent D on the degree of the polynomial uh, explicit. So I have done this, well, in my PhD thesis, I've shown that it is M cubed, uh, but I think very, well, the paper is not accepted yet, but I don't know why it's still not, <laughs> but I suspect it should be this year. Uh, and uh, you can make it just the dimension of the set, um, just like the, Binyamini and Novik of half. Uh, and in fact, uh, after a discussion with uh, Carl Binyamini, I also think that if you use some result in their paper, that you can also obtain the same uh, extra information in the semi algebraic case. But I've not uh, gone through the details. So I put a question mark, but I think the answer is yes, if you, if you put the results together. Okay. So since I have a little bit of time left, I uh, want to try and sketch how to prove this CR parameterization theorem um, of, of Gluckus Pilar Wilkie or, or my version if you want. So suppose you have some set X that is definable, then the first step in your proof is going to be uh, to do a cell decomposition. So the first step, a cell decomposition. So geometrically, what does this do? Well, you can just imagine the pictures that I've given you in the definition of a cell. So it actually well, partitions your set like this, and then you have graphs of functions. Something like this, for example. Okay, and then and, and these graphs are also cells on their own, of course because uh, the union should be X. Um, and then a remark is that a cell is actually the same as a definable function from the unit cube, the same dimension as the cell. So let me write it like this at the moment to X. So how does this work? Let me give an give an example. So suppose your cell C is defined as follows. 
uh, x variable varies between some a and b and y between some alpha in x and beta in x. So now how do I construct this map? Well, you just linearly map um, the square onto C. So in this case, you get a map phi from zero one square to C. And it maps X, Y linearly on the cell. So let's see, I want X times B, then one minus X times A. So it just goes from A to B, and then you do the same in the second coordinate. Uh, so that would be phi times beta. Then I have to plug in this first function. That's why I only do it in dimension two. Okay, like this, I suppose you get the ID and this works in an arbitrary dimension. And for instance, if you just have the graph of a function here, suppose you had y is uh, well, alpha in x, but then of course you put here alpha in this, uh, this same expression. So this is how you map uh, zero one to the power of the dimension of a cell onto the cell. So great, actually, so cell decomposition from this point of view is, is a parameterization theorem, but the maps are just definable. They, they don't even have to be continuous. Of course, if you use a continuous version of the cell decomposition, they are going to be continuous uh, and so on. Okay, then the second step, well, um, monomialize these functions. So here, I'm going to skip a lot of details. I cannot explain uh, resolutions of similarities in a few minutes, but that's of course the ID. So you, you have one of these maps. So I'm just focusing on one of these cells. Um, so it's a map, let's say now from zero one squared to, to, um, to the cell C or to X. And then the ID is that this should now be monomial. Um, Let's see how will I write this. So you want or you obtain is uh, x to some power r and then x something like this, roughly speaking. It's going to be monomial. Now, uh, however, the domain on some cell which I will denote U, which is also given by monomials. So why is that? Well, you use induction. So you first start with your function, um, you partially monomialize it, and then you're also going um, simultaneously um, going to monomialize these walls, for instance, here that you see appearing. So you monomialize a lot uh, at the same time. So for example, how does such a chart then look like? Uh, so example, you could consider uh, y in x, y is, uh, well, they can be negative, these exponents. So for instance, you could uh, divide by y x squared divided by y squared on the following cell. Oh, I denoted it u, sorry. So let's say x is between zero and one. And then of course, if I want this function to be bounded, uh, y has to be between uh, x and one. Then you see that this function is uh, bounded. Or maybe I'm going to remove this square. And the reason I'm going to remove this square is because I also claim that you can arrange that they all have bounded C1 norm. So 
So you can check in this example, since I have cheated and erased the square, now it has found at C11, okay? Um, and in general, you achieve this by using, well, by inverting coordinates if necessary. So, and then the third step, if you are in this situation, of course, this is actually the most difficult part of the proof because, well, monomalization is a, a complicated algorithm if you're not familiar with it. And then the third part is, is maybe the easiest part. So you rescale again. Re, oh, that's not so nice, rescale. So you again, so I mean, you map zero one again onto your set U. So then again, your domain is going to be uh, the unit square and use a power substitution. So for example, if you look at the, the rescaling is in the same fashion as I have defined before. Um, and with the power substitution, we are consider the map phi in x to the power r, y to the power r. Now this is of course, x to the power two r over y to the power r, but you should, well, the domain also transforms. So let me denote it like this. And then this is going to be, no, this is going to stay the same. So it actually does not transform in this case. Sorry for that. Uh, so this is a special case, but the domain usually slightly transform when you take the pullback. But that's not the case for, the, for this set. And so actually what you see to prove that, the, that, that, that this function had bounded C1 norm, well, you just, just use these um, inequality ones that y is uh, strictly larger than x. So for instance, you just estimate, you just replace one X by a Y to bound this function and you get one. And even if you differentiate with respect to Y, you get one over Y squared, uh, but I had two X's so I can still bound one over Y squared. And now you see after you did this power substitution, just combinatorial here, well, now the difference between the enumerator and denominator has become R instead of just one. And so this function, now has bounded, has bounded CR norm. So then we are nearly done with our CR parameterization. So the last step is actually um, well, the CR norm of phi in x to the power r, y to the power r is roughly going to be, let's say, r squared. And the last step would be to solve this. Well, we have the domain of our function is a square and I'm just going to subdivide the square to smaller squares. Let's say sides one over R squared and you map again a unit square onto each of them. So this shrinks, of course, your square onto a smaller one uh, of sides so one over r squared. So you'll need to do this operation well, to cover this right hand square, you will need roughly r squared many. And then your CR norm is just going to be one. Yeah, so the last step is you just linearly reparameterize uh, this unit square and the CR norm is going to be uh, just one. And so in particular, you see in this example, R squared. So you see the dimension of the cell uh, occurring. So it follows by monomalization uh, basically and, um, uh, and then this power substitution method. So that was uh, the sketch of the proof. And then uh, there's still the notion of mild parameterization or should I, should I stop already? I can also skip this part. I think maybe you're running out of time. So maybe you should uh, yeah, okay. wind it up. Then I will skip the mal parameterization. It's not so related. It's a different topic. So I'll, I'll finish here then. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.